Recently in Chess Kid Land, we had the closest one-on-one -on -one match in Chess Kid history. Did you miss it? Well, go watch it now. We have the full replay. But I want to show you one of the most instructive games between Tani and Alice. The whole match went to overtime. This was early on in the match, and it just goes to show you it doesn't matter your age or your rating. You have to know your end games. As always, I want to be fair to both players. They had very limited time at this point in the game, but we are going to learn from our mistakes. And I can 100% guarantee you the reason that both of these players are young chess masters is because hmm. they review all of their games as well. Okay, so set the stage for you. Alice is black in this position. She does have an extra pawn, but it is doubled. It's not very useful right now, that g6 pawn. So she gets her king in the game, and then Tani gets his king in the game to prevent Alice from marching the king forward. Now here, Alice sort of turns the tables, uses her one tempo move to make it Tani's turn. She plays h5, that one pawn move that she had in her pocket. Now, Tani has to make the correct king move in this position. You can see here, there are four legal king moves. One and two and three and four. So if you randomly guess, you will have a 25% chance of saving the game. Boys and girls, chess kids around the world, those are not good odds. So. Instead of randomly guessing, now would be an extra special good time to pause your videos, analyze this position, use what you know about what I've taught you about opposition to get the answer right. Only unpause when you've done the work. If you are back, you are probably lamenting the fact that Funmaster Mike left all that red on the screen. You are seeing red, but did you find the correct move? Okay, well, I'm just gonna tell you what the correct move is. The correct move is, drum roll, can I get a drum roll? Can I make it go longer? Can we keep the anticipation going in case Fun Master Mike gets paid by the second? <gasps> King to E3. If you got that move right, congratulations. You are now worthy of doing your own YouTube videos, maybe. And the point of this move is that Alice really only has two logical moves. She can either push or she can move her king here. Now, if push, Tawny should not take because when Alice takes, she gets the opposition. We're actually going to look at this position in just a minute. However, Tawny can move his king forward, double attacking this pawn, and then after Ow. takes, takes, Ow. he has the opposition. And when Alice runs away, he'll keep the opposition, and the two will go back and forth and do their not happy and their not sad dance. They will do their draw dance. Okay, so we need to go back to this position. After that correct move, king to e3. Alice could move her king forward. Hmm. But then Tani would play king to d3, essentially getting the opposition. Alice's only idea is to play e5, but then after takes and takes, Alice is about to invade, except that Tani shuts her down with king e3. And after king f5, we have king f3, and Alice is not breaking through. This is, again, a draw. So, let's go back. Why were other moves not drawn? Well, I do have to be a journalist here and report that Tani actually did make one of the incorrect moves, which is king to d3. And in fact, if you choose either of these squares, it's going to be the same variation. So if you picked one of those, you're going to get the same line. After king to d3, then when Alice moved her king forward, Tani had to move his king to the side. And now when Alice pushes, look at the difference. This pawn is double attack, so Tani had to oh. capture. But now when Alice oh. takes, it is white's turn, meaning black has the opposition. And at this point, I can 100% guarantee you, both of the players saw the writing on the wall. In fact, only one more move was played. Tani played king f3, Alice played king f5, and you can see the crown and the white flag. Tani resigns because he's getting pushed out of the way. Gary Kasparov calls it shouldering. When the king moves to the left, we go to the right and we push that king out of the way using our shoulder. If the king moves again, we just keep moving. And when the king moves again, we keep moving. And Alice is going to win all of those pawns. So. Great job by Alice, right? Well, yeah, but you know what? She can also improve on her opposition knowledge because if we go back to the very starting position, we already saw that after king to d6, king to e4, if white plays correctly, this is a draw. Would you believe that Alice could have actually won in this position? She could have won by playing king to d7 the long opposition yeah you really have to go into those fun master mike archives to remember all of these ideas because there is an odd number of squares between the kings you can transfer the long opposition into the regular opposition for example 
if the king moves to the square e4, now when you play king to d6, it is white's turn. And that makes all the difference in the world. Because now if the king moves here, which remember before was the correct square, now when Alice puts her king forward and the king moves, she has not wasted her tempo move. Now she'll play h5, forcing the king to the bad square. This is actually a carbon copy of the game. Now these ideas at the end, especially long opposition, they're really hard. If you've not already done your chess kid lesson on both opposition and long opposition and all that stuff, now would be a good time to go do a little refresher course. Hmm. Even chess masters need to review this stuff. So a very cool, I consider end games cool, but a very technical and great end game lesson from these two young masters. Look for more from them in the years to come.